So yeah, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Schumacher College and the Field Center to this Holistic Science Lecture Series. I'm Troy Vine and I run the Holistic Science Masters at Schumacher College and I'm an Associate Re Researcher at the Field Center. So this lecture series is part of an exciting new collaboration between Schumacher College, the Field Center and the Holistic Science Journal. And um, just to give you a couple of uh, words about this collaboration. Um, it began um, as a collaboration between the Holistic Science Journal and the Field Center to produce a journal which is called In Dialogue. And the first issue came out last summer and PDF copies are free of charge. Uh, Simon is posting a link in the chat box. So if you want to um, go to that link, you can download a free copy. Um, also, if like me, you prefer reading in an embodied way, free from the distractions of technology, uh, Ruskin World Trust has kindly offered to send you a free hard copy, free of charge. Um, yeah, so if you'd like a free hard copy, then uh, just send an email to Ruskin Mill. I think, Simon, are you going to put an email in the chat? And uh, I think this is only available to people in the UK. So if you're not in the UK, then my apologies. Um, I'd also like to mention that the entire back catalogue of the Holistic Science Journal is now available online free of charge. So do check out uh, the Holistic Science Journal website. Um, Simon, could you just pop a link uh, online to the Holistic Science Journal? So um, also we have the Holistic Science Conference coming up well, not coming up, but on the 1st to 3rd of October. So some time away, um, the plan is to have this in person. So we are hoping that that will uh, go ahead and the that will be presentations and discussions on the legacy of Henry Bortoft, Margaret Cahoon and Brian Goodwin. Uh, so if you, if you don't know who those people are, then do come. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm very happy with this online lecture. I'm very happy that this online lecture series has attracted so many uh, participants. There is currently uh, 211 of you, and that's still slowly increasing. So that's really exciting. Um, I would like to thank um, Dartington Hall Trust and Ruskin Mill Trust for supporting this series, both financially and organizationally. So this. Holistic, this Holistic Science Lecture Series is a really exciting new uh, project um, and we'll be bringing you a lecture once a month on the first Thursday of every month. And I can think of no better, better person to begin this series than Craig Holdridge. Um, he is the founder and director of the Nature Institute in New York, which is one of the leading organizations for holistic science research and education. Craig's research on holistic science is groundbreaking, not only for the research itself, but also for the language that he cultivates to express holistic science and the findings of holistic science. The importance of this linguistic aspect of research is often overlooked or downplayed as merely relevant for the, the uh, science education. But as philosophers such as Ludwig Wittgenstein and Owen Barford have shown, the language of science is not primarily a medium to communicate the results of scientific research, but is an essential part of the very research itself. The results of the research and the language with, with, within, with which they're expressed are inseparable. So Craig's effort um, to shape a new language for holistic science is, is, is a benefit to us all um, in, in our different um, areas within which we, we, we work. So before I hand you over to Craig, I'd just like to give you a quick um, overview of the structure of this lecture. Um, so Craig will talk for about an hour and then we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, if you have any questions, then please put your questions in the Q&A box. So there's a chat box and there's a Q&A box and questions that you'd like Craig to then answer at the end of the lecture go in the Q&A box and the chat box, obviously feel free to write uh, as, you, as you see fit in, in, in the chat box. 
Okay, so without more ado, I'd like to thank Craig Holdridge very much for opening this lecture series and hand you over to him. Craig, would you like to go ahead? Okay, now I'm, I'm there. I'm now, there. now it's you. <laughs> All right, good. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to all of you. Some of you who I'm sure I know, and unfortunately we can't be in person, but this is wonderful to be able to connect with people all over the world. And, you know, to speak about a way of looking um, at nature, participating with nature, doing science, um, that I think is really important. Um, for the present and for the future. And I called the talk um, Goethe and the Evolution of Science. And that um, title refers to Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who is best known as um, um, one of the uh, premier German poets um, the giant of literature, um, who lived from 1749 to 1832. And in the wider culture, he's less known for his science, although he had quite a bit of influence um, on many um, scientists and philosophers um, about the nature of science and scientific inquiry. So in this talk, I want to kind of I want to always ground this in Goethe himself and his work, not mainly as it, I mean, I'm not a historian, so as this is not a historical lecture, but because he himself as um, had really special capacities as um, someone who was really um, grounded in language and how language can, um, uh, bring the world to expression or hide the world through the way one speaks. So he had a beautiful way of, of formulating things as a poet, but in his science that went into the way he um, was able to express the, the work that he has had done in his life and, um, and also in his relation to others. So the, on the one hand that, that, basis in the language that he has from his artistic capacities. And he had this incredible love and um, commitment to trying to understand nature in a deeper way. So I want to focus, of course, on his scientific work. And in the second part of the title, The Evolution of Science, why I think the kind of work that he inaugurated and that people around the world have attempted to take further in the last you know, 150 years, um, that that really has significance and that we, um, we can learn something from that. So I will be giving quite a few examples of Goethe's work, but with an eye towards, well, what's their significance today and for the future? So, Already as a young man, he was 25 years old, he was famous in the German-speaking language. Um, he he'd published a novel, um, The Sorrows of Young Werther, that made him famous. He was in and he was 25 years old. And so his career was, you know, shooting off and he would have had no problem to remain um, just a literary giant for the rest of his long life. But he also early on began to study nature. And he, he always had an, he had an interest in nature as a child. But then when he was asked to move to Weimar, Germany, um, he, by the Duke of this small dukedom in, of the Duchy of Weimar, uh, to be part of the government, which is a strange thing for a poet. And Goethe took on all sorts of tasks. And this was in his late 20s, early 30s. 
he was part of the government. He was the, the minister of mines. He headed the art school. He, for a while, he was head of the 600 man army. Lots of different tasks that he took on. And among those were um, more on, in the underground, his studies of plants and animals. And the, I'd like to begin with the, the study that he did, studies he did of animals. And this began because he was the director of the art school. And in addition to being director of the theater, and he was interested in himself being able to draw better and in, interested in animal form. So he learned from the um, main anatomist at, a, at the University of Jena, which wasn't far away. And he studied animal skulls, drawing them. And through this professor and the collaboration with him, um, Goethe got more and more into the details of animal morphology. And he was someone who not only liked to study himself, see the things himself, feel them, really get into the phenomena, he also always read what was going on in his times. He was very knowledgeable of the science of his time. So he started reading about um, what we today know as comparative morphology. And he, he read that there was, that there was a, a, an opinion, a theory, hypothesis, whatever you want to call it, out there that said, well, there's this particular bone in the human skull that humans have, but that animals, mammals, I'll just stick with mammals now, mammals don't have. And this bone separates the human from the animals because all other bones are we have in common with the mammals, but this one bone um, doesn't exist. So our you could say our humanness, so to speak, hangs on one bone. And what's interesting here is that for Goethe, that went against the grain. That went against the grain of the whole way he had begun to see the world, now in, in, now in the, the organic world, and what that, or how the organic world reveals itself through bone structure and shape. And he saw that, look, all these other bones are that we have in our skull, for example, are in the mammals. And one bone is supposed to be the bone that makes us, so to speak, human, sets us apart. He said, no, that can't be. And so with his professor Loder together, he started to investigate um, the uh, skulls of apes, monkeys, um, and could he find other um, of a, enough of human skulls to see, well, maybe it's, it does appear here and there, and maybe it appears in skulls of children or even of fetuses. So they started, you know, finding um, skulls in different museums, investigating them, and um, a number of years later, they actually then wrote a paper saying, that the os intermaxillaris, the, what we call today call the premaxillary bone in the skull of humans also exists. It does not, it is not a bone that we don't have, but it's a bone that's very inconspicuous and that you um, only see, to so, see, so to speak, in its hints in um, the human being in skulls of human beings every once in a while. So that, um, that shows you something about the way Goethe thought. And I'd like to read a couple of the things he said in um, letters to friends at that time. So this is uh, one of the letters. Or one excerpt. I have found neither gold nor silver, but something that makes me unspeakably glad, the os intermaxillary in the human being. While comparing animal and human skulls with Loder, 
I came on its tracks and saw it there. So I found neither gold nor silver, but I found this little bone. Interesting, right? He gets very excited by the fact that he found something that shows the unity of formation that we have together with the mammals. So I'd like to show you a few slides now and um, to, so that you get a little bit of a sense of what he was looking at. It'll be just a second. Okay. Yep. All right. So there's a, there are some images of different skulls of a horse, a white-tailed deer, and a mountain lion. And you, we're not going to the details of anatomy, don't worry. Um, but here, the bone we're talking about is the bone that's frontmost in the skull that forms um, what we would often call the snout in an animal. Here, here, and here. It's where the skull projects most um, to the front of the animal out of which the incisors grow. And it's a prominent bone as you can see in the horse. And this bone gets less prominent in animals that um, have uh, shorter skulls. But I'll just hear with the horse. This is actually a drawing that um, Goethe had in the monograph afterwards that was done for that monograph. And this premaxillary bone is here. And then the incisors coming out of it. He also you know, looked at some monkey skulls. This is also a drawing from that monograph. And this premaxillary bone is, you can see it best here on the underside of the hard palate. You see the sutures that separate it from the next bone and then here. So it's there, but it's not nearly so prominent in monkeys and apes. And then he started looking, the human. Again, the, this one is from the, oh, sorry, Whoop, need to go back. Um, the, human uh, the human skull. And you can see maybe very finely the sutures here in the upper hard palate. So if you put your tongue right behind where your uh, mo frontmost incisors are, your tongue up there, then you are putting your tongue against this little remnant of the premaxillary bone here in this. And you do not, do not see it normally in the front of the skull. That's why people had overlooked it because the human skull, of course, has very little forward jutting jaw. So in the formation of the skull, the skull does not project forward. It closes to the front and the premaxillary bone, which is huge in the, in the um, horse, remains tiny in the human. Just as bones that are small in the horse get very big in the human. So he saw, uh, Bone is there, but it's there in a different way. So he writes, again, in a letter, the difference between the human being and the animal is not to be found in anything particular, not in a particular bone. Rather, the human being is closely related to animals, not something people liked to hear around uh, 18... 85. And so the human being is closely related to animals. The agreement within the whole makes every creature what it is. 
The human being is a human being down to the form and nature of the last segment of the little toe. And so it is that every creature is one tone, one shade of a great harmony that one must study as a whole, lest every particular become a dead letter. So agreement within the whole so that every creature down into the last seg of their little toe or in the way their premaxillary bone is formed or where the way the where their hand bones are formed, their finger bones, all of that, every one of those is expressive of the whole organism. Every creature is one tone, one shade of a great harmony that one must study as a whole lest every particular become a dead letter. The dead letter is the anatomical detail isolated from the whole organism, which is, you know, any of us who studied biology, you were, um, you were, yeah, inflicted with the task of memorizing, memorizing, memorizing things for which you had no context. And what Goethe was really pointing to is that everything in reality, in the living world, has a meaningful context within the whole of which it is a part. And so in this little example, which people can kind of think is you know, strange, why did a great poet worry about a little bone? Well, it's not because the little bone is itself, you could say, so important, and yet it is, because it is expressive of the whole. It's about the fact that every part in an organic being is integrated into the whole, and you cannot understand either the part or the whole without seeing their relations. So Goethe was a holistic scientist. Right? He really focused on how the parts are configured to express the whole. So he went into great detail. He didn't avoid details. He wasn't fuzzy. Um, he went into detail, but the D, who was always intent on seeing how does this now show something about the human being? How does this show me something about the lion? How does it show me, show me something about the horse? So that is really important to understand his approach. And so it's, it's not so much about what Goethe discovered. That's interesting, you know, in the history of biology, he's known as somebody who, you know, discovered the co-discoverers, there were other people who talked about it as well, of the premaxillary bone, but that's not so important as the fact that he was inaugurating a holistic take on um, the world, that a really an intention, how can, I, how can I see wholeness in nature? And he even wrote in his you know, great uh, play Faust, he has this little statement in there and he says, consider what, but consider even more the how, how something is formed. So how is the premaxilla formed in us? How is the premaxilla in a horse? How is it in this creature or that creature? So he related then the human being, the parts of the human being to the human being, but then you can understand the human being by comparing with our fellow creatures so that you understand the lion through the zebra. You understand um, the elephant also by studying um, zebras and lions and other creatures so that you become more and more, uh, the context becomes broader and broader and illuminates the parts. So that's this holistic approach of Gertis. Now, I want to just, this, I'm going to just show this next slide as I'm going to talk for a little while, and we're going to come to this phenomenon later. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but so that you have something nice to look at. Um, and 
the, I'd like to, well, let me just read one more or two more little uh, excerpts from his writings about this holistic approach. With any given phenomenon in nature, and especially if it is striking or significant, we should not stop and dwell on it, cling to it, and view it as existing in isolation. Instead, we should look about in the whole of nature to find where there is something similar, something related. So right away, how is it related to other things? Don't look at it in isolation. Look at it in its relations. For only when related elements are drawn together will a whole gradually emerge that speaks for itself and requires no further explanation. Things explain themselves through their mutual relations, not by a particular element alone. Um, so when he's, if, if what I'd like to do is just get, um, give you a little picture of if we move to the present and most of you will know, you know, have read things, heard things about genes, um, about genetics. And, you know, at the end of the 20th century, there was the Human Genome Project. And around that time, there was an article in Science Magazine um, with the title, Which of Our Genes Make Us Human? Sound familiar? Which of our bones make us human? Uh, which of our genes make us human? And then the, the author, and this was around the time where they found out that, you know, 98.5% of our genes are similar to those of a chimpanzee, um, and therefore, watch the therefore, <laughs> therefore 1.5% of our genes must be the ones that have to do with our humanity. So the author writes, this means that a very small portion of human DNA is responsible for the traits that make us human and that a handful of genes somehow confer everything from an upright gait to the ability to recite poetry and compose music. So you see, that's not holistic thinking. It's not asking how the genome is configured, that humanness can arise, that monkeyness can arise, chimpanzeeness can arise, but it's saying, oh, there must be these parts that are the ones that make us human. It must, it's these parts of the brain that make us think that or that. It's this or that hormone imbalance that's making me feel like the way I feel. One reduces human experience or human biology to particular factors. Right? That is a trend of our times in science, but in culture, broadly speaking, to look for the particular causes that are supposed to make the whole. And yet what Goethe was already seeing a long time ago was, no, we, un we gain understanding by looking how those parts how the genes, the hormones, the, the different parts of the brain are integrated into the whole. Not that they are a cause, but they are a part of, um, part of this coherence of the whole organism. So there you can already see this is an approach that um, balances the, the more one-sided striving to always try to get at a particular cause. Because what it does is it contextualizes those and gives them actually in the end meaning. So Goethe 
was a holistic scientist. He um, Let me put it this way. So the holistic science, you could also say it in modern terms, he was an ecological thinker because he always saw things in relation. That was his task. He'd say, I look at a detail, okay, how can I relate it to things? So this eminently e ecological, but not in just finding all the different factors that influence, but trying to see, okay, now how does that make a whole? How is, how is the whole expressed in that? How can we gain, see the, the meaning inherent in nature through this holistic approach? That's what he's striving for in his work. And those of us who have been trying to um, work further in this, you could say, in this uh, trajectory is what we're trying to do, right? How can we gain an understanding of nature that is not only, you could say, mechanistic, but gives you one a sense of the meaning and coherence of the world. In as much as one finds it, we're not about there. We're not, and Goethe was not there, and we're not there to say we're trying to create something that doesn't exist. We're trying to find something in nature um, that is real, because we can see animals are coherent wise creatures, plants are coherent wise creatures, the way ecosystems um, are fashioned out of all these different elements, there's a wisdom in that. Can we begin to access it? Can we begin to access it? So that is one aspect of his work. I'd like now to go to another aspect, um, which is related to his work with plants. So Goethe studied plants, and you see this rose, we'll come back to that. And he um, studied plants on his own. I won't go into all that at the moment, but he also you know, read a lot about the botany of his times and the botany as if times was really um, um, influenced as botany still is today. And you could say in many ways by Linnaeus who found this way of categorizing plants um, and naming plants in their character and, and, and talking about their characteristics um, that really gave us certain clarity that you could classify plants and Goethe thought that was really important, but he also, it also stifled him. He said, it, re it stifled him. And why did it stifle him? Because, as he said, um, wait a minute. I lost courage to drive in a stake or to draw a boundary line when on the self-same plant I discovered first round and then notched and finally almost pinnate leaves, which later contracted, were simplified, turned into scales, and at last disappeared entirely. The problem of designating genera, genera with, their, with any certainty or of arranging the species under them seemed insoluble to me. So he, what he saw is there, when we classify things and make separations, we're doing something that's also artificial. So uh, what I'd like to do is just show you some slides now. Um, the first ones come from me, the later ones come from, from Goethe himself, um, and then talk more about what he came to. So, I'd like to show you what he was just talking about. I'm showing you now a sequence of leaves from one plant, from the main stem of one plant that had been plucked off the plant and pressed. And I'm showing you them now from bottom up. So what you see here are the two cotyledons, the seed leaves that emerge in the seed. And then when the seed germinates are the first to arise, um, in the above ground plant as it's already begun to take root in the soil. 
And then the first leaf on the stem of this particular plant looks like that. And now I'll just show you some more. Second leaf gets larger, still is rounded, but has some um, indentations in the margin. Gets still bigger, still quite rounded. The size increase continues. The surface of the leaf gets larger, continues in this differentiation that these little lobes um, are getting more pronounced, especially towards more the bottom of the leaf or in the middle part of the leaf. The growth continues. Doesn't seem to be a lot of change there. And then you get this, in this case, a jump. That's the next leaf on the stem, but it's smaller. The, the differentiation has disappeared. It's got more pointy. Um, it's more pointy overall. The teeth at the margin are more pointy and not so rounded, wavy. And the last leaf looks like that. And that's what Goethe meant is that, well, how am I supposed to say there are different types of leaves and categorize them when I see that one plant brings forth in its few months of development, very different kinds of leaves from each other. You'd never know that the first one belonged to the same plant as the last one, if you didn't look carefully, right? You could think it was a different plant. So the plant is going through a transformation in its development. And this, is, Goethe was attuned to that, you could say, because this is something that gets very, that, that's talked about very little in academic um, botany is actually the process of transformation. And the, the, the way forms change over time and the plant has the ability to bring forth different types of forms. And this was the beginning of what Goethe observed things like this, of what of his concept of what the metamorphosis of the plant, how now in the case of the green leaves, there is green leafness showing itself differently in the life cycle of the plant. And then that modif continues to modify into the flowering part of the plant, um, which I'm not going to go into. That would be too long of a talk to show, you know, how he came to this insight um, that the different parts of the flower are also have this quality of leaf, but very different from the leaves of the, um, um, the green leaves that we normally call leaves, but that you can call the petals leaves and you can even call the stamens leaves. Um, so he wrote about this in his little book called um, The Metamorphosis of Plants. And in that um, book, I'm just going to skip a slide now. Um, um, ah, yeah, so in that book, he goes to a, a, different, what, a different type of metamorphosis, which I'll come to in a moment. But here you just have some examples of different leaf transformations in different species of plants. So each plant does it in its own way. These are annual plants that do this most radically. Um, and each has their own style. So then Goethe, these are uh, paintings that were done, especially for his book um, on the metamorphosis of plants where he speaks of what he calls an irregular metamorphosis. And these are two tulips. One tulip has already lost its petals, but one down here would, normally be a green leaf, but it's colored like a petal. Or here you have even something more fascinating that you have a green leaf that has, that has not separated with a petal right, completely. At, the, at their base, they've separated, but here they form one leaf and it's kind of half petal and half um, green leaf, foliage leaf. And Goethe loved these kind of phenomena, these um, malformations. Why? 
because they showed the flexibility of the plant, that the plant is not programmed, but that there is there are the possibilities of, of not only the regular transformation that every plant will go through in its own way, but then there's this, I often call it playfulness. He never used that word. There's a playfulness in nature that reveals, oh, it can do it this way. It can do it that way. And that, that gives you a hint at the po a hint of the possibilities that a plant has to develop that we normally don't see, right? That we normally don't take into account. So I'm wanting to show a couple other examples that he has in the, in the, from his monograph. These are petals um, from a rose, but petals, the normal petals up here and here petals that have partially become stamens where they're part stamen, which normally comes after the petals, but and part petal. So again, you have this melding of two things that normally are distinct, but the plant can also show them both at the same time. Another example uh, from a type of um, primrose where normally the flowers look like this, and in some cases you get double flowers. So the flower, which normally ends with um, wilting and seeding, right, fruiting and seeding, this flower then, each of the flowers brings forth a whole new flower on top of itself. Another malformation that shows this potential that's hidden in the plant normally, but that can come to expression. And that was this one you were seeing before of a rose that's doing something similar that instead of forming um, you know, stamens, et cetera, on the inside after the petals, it form, begins to form a whole new shoot in a, we would call malformed way, but that then a whole new plant can come out of that on top of itself. So this, what he called irregular metamorphosis as not being something bad, but as being expression, expressive of nature's potential you could also say nature's creativity. So he entered into this way of, uh, uh, of the plant's existence that he was always perceiving it as a growing, developing, metamorphosing creature. Now, a third aspect is that he looked at plants in different contexts. He studied them in different environments. And this really took off for him, uh, this study when he left as about a 37 year old man, um, right after his birthday in August, he didn't, he told two people that he was going to take off and go to Italy. And so nobody knew he went in, incognito because he was already famous to Italy and spent two years in Italy. And his plant studies really came to a fruition during this time. And part of it had to do, he was seeing plants in different environments. They weren't all like they were in Germany when he got up into the Alps, when he came off uh, uh, down from the Alps into northern, um, into northern Italy, when he then went into southern Italy. He was seeing plantness in new expressions. And he just had this ability to always, ah, this is the expression, this is expressing itself this way. Oh, I have this chain. This is one part I know from this plant, and it's this way and that one. So this incredibly dynamic nature of plants filled his soul because he was a very careful observer. And the way he observed, there was always life in it. He was seeing the expressions of life. So um, this is an example that does not come from Goethe, does not come from me. It comes from a colleague of mine many, many years ago who did a study of the forms of trees in the winter time. And some of you who know me have seen this <laughs> before. Um, and uh, this is a, a basswood tree in the winter. Those are basswood trees in the winter. And those are basswood trees 
in the winter. And they were all growing within a mile of each other or so. So the basswood tree can express itself differently in different contexts. And so he, um, what, what Matthias then was able to find was that depending on where they were growing, they showed themselves differently. And this was, these are the trees growing on the southern exposure of a hillside, of a valley, I mean. These on the northern exposure, and this in an open meadow. So what the plant is, is a potential, now to use Henry Bortoff's term, to be itself differently, not only in its individual development through its different types of leaves, but also in the context in which it's growing. It's incredibly uh, flexible. It has a flexible nature, transforming flexibility, and it's in, in incredible um, close relation to what we call the environment. It brings to expression how it's relating to the world on a southern exposure or on another ex northern exposure or out on an open meadow. So those are all the slides. I'm going to um, stop that. And um, now what I'd like to Try, try to bring now kind of to, together are the different, you know, kind of the significance of Goethe's approach, these different facets. Um, and so on the one hand, he was able to see things in relationships and in their dynamism. So the ecological approach in the sense of saying, how does this relate to that? Think back to the skulls, right? Um, but then how does an organism transform? Uh, that an organism, a living being lives through transformation. Can I see how it transforms and yet remains an integrated whole? So this very dynamic way of looking. Uh, it, when I say looking at the world, it's really wrong because the world's not an at. It's then he's participating in the phenomena of relationship and dy dynamism in nature. He's participating in that. So his approach is a participatory or as I also say sometimes, a dialogic approach. He didn't use that term. Um, where he's really um, entering, um, giving himself over, you could say, to the phenomena with a perceiving that's very delicate, gentle, what he calls a gentle empiricism. But so really going with the phenomena, but then that the thinking goes with that, is in that. And the thinking is not abstracted at a distance, but is participating in and realizes what's happening, <laughs> right? So this is where he says, my perceiving is a thinking and my thinking is a perceiving. And um, that's, that's Goethe's formulation, um, well, that he actually, that somebody commented on his work and said it's objective. And it's objective not by distancing, but by connecting and becoming um, intimate with the object. So that the, in a certain way, the object loses its object character and it becomes a partner in a dialogue. Right? Um, so, this approach is different 
from what we normally think of as science today, even though I think many scientists kind of um, do this um, in their own ways, but it doesn't become part of scientific discipline. Because what this means is that the scientist needs to develop. So I'd like to let Bert to speak again. Um, just need to find right quotations. If we want to behold nature in a living way, we must follow her example and become as mobile and malleable as nature herself. She has something to teach us. We have to follow her example and change ourselves. It's not about us coming with a particular paradigm or theory and impressing that upon nature, but trying to enter into the phenomena to see um, what they have to tell us and to try to, try to adapt our, own, our sensibilities to the phenomena themselves. And so that the phenomenon in, an, in animals are different in plants and different in fungi, and different in bacteria, different in viruses, different in landscapes. And you have to adapt your sensibilities to those different realms to see what's, what's, what's showing itself here in the natural world. So he has this sense of the, the, the greatness of the world. And organ, I'm quoting now, an organic being is externally so many-sided and internally so manifold and inexhaustible that we cannot choose enough points of view to behold it. We need to go at it from different sides, look at the plant in different developmental stages in different contexts, look at the animal and its relations to the different to, to its environment, to different kinds of animals, etc. So this get into this weaving so, um, from different points of view to be able to begin to fathom um, this manifold and inexhaustible um, nature of organic life. And so he says then continues, and we cannot develop enough organs in ourselves in order to examine it, the organic being, without killing it. What does that mean? Organs in ourselves. Now, he doesn't mean a new eye or a new ear. He means what he would call spiritual organs, mental organs in English, perhaps, whatever phrase you want to use. But it's the sensibility, the way of thinking that we, we can begin to learn by following the example of nature. And then that, oh, that forms an organ of perception in us that we begin to see more the living qualities of the world. And that's what it's about. And now in the biological sciences, right? I'm speaking from the biological sciences. Um, so there is a delicate empiricism that makes itself utterly identical with its object, thereby becoming true theory, meaning understanding, right? And then he continues, but this enhancement of our mental powers belongs to a highly evolved age. He was clear, this is not easy. These are the analytical capacities, the intellectual analytical capacities we have today, we, they, in his time and not today, but this, you could say this morphodynamic thinking, this um, contextual, contextual seeing, that's what he saw we needed to, need to develop. He had a gift, um, but it's work. It was work for Goethe, and it certainly worked for most of us who were trying to practice this approach, that you come up against your own limits and you try to overcome them through continually going back to the phenomena, immersing yourself in the, pro in the processes, um, and, um, and trying to um, listen to what the phenomena are telling you, right? So that you're, that's the dialogue part, 
right? The plant doesn't speak with words. The animal doesn't speak with words. It speaks, speaks with its processes, with its forms. And the question is, can we hear that? Can we understand it? So this um, element of what uh, one author, Frederick Amrine, called the metamorphosis of the scientist, right? That, it's, that, we, that science is a process of development of human capacities, and not just using the capacities we already have to interrogate nature. And that's, I would call it a nature world-friendly approach right, where one's part, trying to participate in that which nature has to show, and then to develop one's ideas, and then, of course, one's actions in relation to that. That um, seems to me to be very important today, where the tendency of fragmentation, what we do what we do in nature is to bring fragmentation. The way we think about the world is often fragmented. We have all sorts of different opinions and theories. And the question of actual conversation, of actually trying to, to hear what the other's saying, and the, and the other, it can be a plant, another human being, a landscape, that we integrate ourselves consciously into the organic nature of life. I really think that's what Goethe's approach um, is about. And it's not about having to follow exactly what Goethe did, of course. There was no one method. I think that's sometimes misunderstood. But there's, a, um, that there's an intentionality of the way to turn towards the world in a new way that I think is very germinal still and has, as germinal, has lots of potency. So I'd like to close by letting Goethe speak. Um, he writes, as human beings, we know ourselves only insofar as we know the world. We perceive the world only in ourselves, and ourselves only in the world. Every new object, clearly seen, opens up a new organ of perception in us. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Craig. Thanks for such an inspiring talk. Um, so I'm now going to uh, I'm now going to look uh, and see what questions we have. And so yeah, so the first question um, from Stephen was. Um, Stephen says, um, I'm interested in how Girton science is being applied now in contemporary projects, e.g. imaginal knowing. Can Craig share any examples or tell stories to illustrate later in the talk? So contemporary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, there, are, there are people around the world doing different kinds of work. I'm most familiar with the biological, biological work. And um, that, but there's also you know, work in physics, which Joy could speak more about than I, I can. Um, but let me just try to give one or two examples. Um, the, you know, the studies of, of plant development that uh, you know, I just hinted at, I've done a lot of that. And in relation to studying the dynamics of plant growth and how the organism is a coherent whole, 
um, led me a long, quite a long time ago um, to question what are we talking about when we're talking about genes, right? Because the way I learned about genes um, in the 1970s, um, in the way one often still learns about them today, these discrete entities that make things happen. This causes that. But when I discovered, you know, um, and then went into this in more detail than I'll try to describe here, than I can describe here, um, that this flexibility um, of the plant, this plastic, plasticity, that it can always be itself differently. What does that mean? And so when I started looking more into, into genetics, it was clear to me actually that the concept that most of us were carrying around was wrong. Because if in every moment a plant can be different, and in that no two plants are the same, no two leaves are the same, it's always in an ongoing, it has the ongoing possibility of being different, then there is no this that determines that. Right, the so-called phenotype is itself something plastic, and that must mean that the genes or the genetic realm has plasticity to it. And we didn't talk like that in in the 1970s and 80s. And but I was convinced that this was you 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 had to be able to find plasticity at the genetic level. So then we started doing research into what now literature research. What are the what is genetics finding? And it's especially within the past couple of decades that genetics finds, lo and behold, everything at the genetic level is just as fluid as the level of the appearances, the macro appearances. So this is research. Um, and there are lots of publications on our website from me and from my colleague, Steve Talbot, about contextualizing genetic understanding through taking phenomena seriously and then over um, moving beyond the restricted, more mechanistic understanding of life. So I think that's a real co uh, important contribution that uh, this Gertian holistic approach can have is by seeing the phenomena in their larger relations, you can contextualize the more narrow reductive um, knowledge, which is, in the knowledge is amazing you know, at those levels, what one has found, but it doesn't lead to understanding unless you collect, real understanding unless you contextualize it. So that's one example of trying, working contemporary in, in, in now in these times, and doing phenomenological research, but then relating it to um, you know, really important issues of our times around genetics or around evolution and other topics. And there are people, various people in, um, have done that kind of work. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for highlighting the importance of that work uh, in, in the contemporary context. So I have uh, the next question that I'll go to is from Mike. And he says, um, one of the things I've found very interesting is that Goethe was doing a form of phenomenology long before Husserl, um, as laid out in his crisis of the European sciences. Do you have any thoughts on the relationship between Husserl and Goethe's thinking, particularly with regard to empathy, intersubjectivity and the life world? Uh, I've read Husserl some, but I'm not qualified to really talk about him, very honestly, I can't. But what I, you know, Husserl was a philosopher. Goethe was not a philosopher. Goethe was a scientist. And now, I mean, he was a poet too, but scientist, meaning he was doing studies of plants and animals and clouds and color and, um, he was studying the phenomenal world. And in that sense, he was a phenomenologist. Husserl articulated what, from a philosophical point of view, what um, 
a phenomenal, a, phen a, a phenomenon oriented way of being in the world would bring. And so in as much as I understand the part around the life world, so you could say lived experience, this be, uh, being attentive to lived, and as people call it today, this is not who's real, of course, embodied experience, right? That comes out of the phenomenological tradition if you think of Merleau-Ponty, for example, right? The, the embodied experience. And Goethe was that, I mean, I think in the Goethean approach, that is really important that you see yourself as a whole being embodied in the world, participating with it. And the empathy is this turning towards. I mean, you're, you're in a certain way, turning towards is in a way wrong because you're part of it, but you, you are, um, you're giving yourself over to the other in order to try to understand the other on its own terms, right? Um, so that, the, the, the always being aware of the fact that knowledge will be most holistic the more we bring our whole being into the process, I think is really important. And I think that's why all the, you know, the writing about lived experience, um, embodied experience is really important. Um, but one can talk a lot about phenomenology and still not do it in Goethe's sense. And I think that's a key thing. Because, you know, I look around, well, well, who from the Husserl people have done some real phenomenological studies? That pro There are some. Um, and it's different than Goethe. I think it's, it's different from Goethe. Complementary, perhaps, I'm, I'm not going to say. Um, I don't know enough. But I think the doing is really important because you reach so many boundaries and, and difficulties and it's easy to talk about it, but it's another thing to do it. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I can say. Yeah, no, thanks, that's great. Um, I'm just gonna follow up with a question from um, Janice. I'm not going in uh, chronological order. I'm, I'm just looking for related themes. So she asked, um, are there any daily exercises that we can do to develop this relationship with nature? Yeah, there are lots. Um, um, but you, I mean, to actually take some living phenomenon, like at our, in our part of the world now, hopefully spring will be coming in a month or two. I mean, some of you may be already in spring, but even if you're in fall, but you take a plant, take a tree and actually follow the process. Follow the process. Um, and I often think with plants, it's often like a weekly rhythm is really nice. You could take the bud of a tree, tree that's about to develop, or you plant a seed. If you're in a city and in an environment where, you know, potted plants are easier than plant a seed and you watch every week, you watch it, you describe for your, its move, its, its development, colors, texture, and you come back to it the next week, what's changed? And in the, the plant's been in a process during that time. And you've got snapshot one, snapshot two, right? Um, and what the plant is continuous. So we need to school the continuity by then saying, okay, the plant was like this. Now let me, ima let me imagine first that plant concretely, you know, the, the bud before it's opened. How does it look? What's its texture? I actually imagine that very concretely. And then the next time I come out and I look at it, feel it, smell it, and I reimagine it. And then I connect those two pictures with each other in this, not outwardly, but I said, okay, how might the one have gone into the other, right? This is now, you're using your imagination to, to let the one move into the other. So you're schooling the con uh, a pictorial, imaginative consciousness um, taken from the world, but that gives you, you're, you're moving into the sphere in which the plant lives by being in the flow of change. 
because otherwise we've always got snapshots, which is always what makes us think the world is, consists of objects, which it doesn't. <laughs> it consists of processes. And so by following that over time, it's a wonderful experience. <clears throat> the simplest things show the most amazing things. Um, and that's one example. There are many more, um, but I think that's, that's one. It's a good place to start. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, so I'd like to follow that up with a question from Dijek, if I pronounced that correctly. And uh, the question is um, that you're, you closed your talk with the, with the quote from Goethe, every new object clearly seen opens up a new organ of perception inside us. Yeah. And so the question is, uh, could you expand on this? Um, yeah, just... Yeah. Yeah, if you could expand on that. And, and also he, um, also the, 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 the question was um, that the questioner could see that Goethe's way of working opens up a new organ of perception, but, but then kind of questions whether every object can open up a new organ of perception, because Goethe says every object opens up a new organ of perception. So whether you could just say a few words to that. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, if you just take what I was just speaking about, imagine you start looking at bugs. And then you do what I was just talking about. And then you, you will see that your relation to buds changes. Buds are no longer what they were and before. So if you immerse yourself in this concrete um, way with given phenomenon, internalize it through the imaginative process, go back out to it again. Um, and and you're building you're building a capacity and that's that's the organ. So that when you go back out, you started to build a little organ for budding in the world. And buds will become more interesting. You'll see, oh this bud does it differently. And that and then your concept, your, we use the word concept, it's really dry. Your concept of, of bud grows. Your, 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 the reality of bud is showing itself more to you. And you are, bud has become part of you as a way of looking, as a way of interacting. And that's the organ of perception so that then budness speaks more. And of course, we all know this in areas that we've concerned ourselves with, that we, that, that we might get excited about things and the person next to us goes, oh, so what? It's because they, they have not engaged in this way. You know, that a painter going through a forest will see colors in a way that I do not see them, right? They've got an organ for the world of color. So it's the practice that gives you capacities to engage, um, engage with a realm of phenomena more intimately, that it can say more. And is that for every realm? Um, I would think so. I would think so. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Um, so I'd like to follow that up with a question from Philip, and he's asking, um, can, you comment on the, uh, can you comment on the use of technology, for example, telescopes, microscopes, body scanners, and their relation to um, holistic science? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, some people have the misunderstanding that Goethe said, no, 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 you know, no microscopes, no telescopes, bad, bad, bad. That's not the case. He did say the human being is the most perfect instrument. And what he was pointing to is we never can get away from the human being. If you make an instrument that's embodiment of a certain kind of intelligence that mediates your experience. So it's very important, I think, to try to be aware of when you're using a technology that the phenomenon, you're looking at the phenomenon in a new context. And in a certain way, it's a different phenomena. 
the new phenomenon. You need to then be clear that when you relate a telescopic picture of the moon to uh, an image of the moon to your image of the moon um, when you're out in the field lying in, during a full moon, that, you know, so how do I relate those two? That's a question, right? The microscopic image from the macroscopic. And the more refined the technology gets, the harder that is. And so it, it and it becomes very difficult. And, you know, I've tried to do, you know, I've been, I've studied a lot about genetics, right? But I haven't seen a lot of the things, right? You see it in, on a screen, you see it in an, some kind of an image, um, an electron microscopic image of a virus is something that is um, in one sense, uh, I better be careful here, an artifact of the way we're viewing it. Meaning, uh, put it differently, that sounds always bad, but it's, it's an interaction between phenomena and world, a world and technology that allows something new to appear. And then we call that the virus, you know, magnified 100,000 times, and this is what we see. So the, the more the things become mediated, I think it's more and more difficult to actually understand their reality, right? To, to know what, what it is we're dealing with. I think it's an important challenge for us Gertian people and holistic people to not shy away from trying to understand that because today everything is technology mediated in our lives. So we've got to take that seriously. Right? And nonetheless, I would say the schooling through the non-mediated is really important because that forms capacities that you won't necessarily form in the other. And it, and it gets more difficult. Um, the, 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 yeah, the more refined the technologies become. And that's in biology. Think of physics, Ugh. right? Uh, so it's even more complicated. Yeah, thanks for that, that answer, Craig. Um, that leads very nicely into uh, a question from Marilia. Um, and the question is whether it is possible to reduce the huge gap between holistic science and conventional academic science. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> well, you know, this, I, mean, I don't know. It's, it's huge. It is huge. When you just look at, you know, how a scientific publication has to be written, what gets lost in the process, you know, an incredible amount gets lost by having to write about it in a particular way. So this comes back to what Troy said, you know, in his introduction, you know, the language, how we express things. You know, Goethe was referred to in the very first issue of, of Nature magazine. Um, he was quoted by T.H. Huxley in 1869. And there, the guest editorial featured Mr. Goethe. Um, and he, Goethe could never appear in Nature magazine today, right? It, and so in staying Goethe, and so I don't know. I mean, it's not as though there's what I'm do. What I've done related to genetics, or when I'm thinking of what my colleague Steve Talbot has been doing in the last decade related to um, the the study of epigenetics and evolutionary theory, one is in conversation the whole time with. Um, what one could call, you know, normal, traditional, contemporary science. Um, and one can be also in dialogue with individuals who are a little bit more at the fringe, who are the ones critiquing certain things that have become rigid paradigms. Um, but it's, uh, it's not easy um, to, I mean, uh, what we, you know, what I think what we can try to do is from the phenomenological perspective, take as much into account from what science brings today 
and bring new aspects to expression. And then there may be people who are interested in that, right? And that, and that there, and, and there are conversations. We do have conversations. There needs to be more. I mean, I, I definitely think there needs to be more. But it is, it is an issue, you know, you have, you know, some of the people who write interesting things kind of at the margin, who are they? They're emeritus professors who can now really say what they think. Um, so I don't know, it's a, it's a wish of mine. Um, and yet the, the, the reality of really seeing it as a transforma human transformation being important in the process and not only that new techniques are going to give us the answers, but new capacities will give us different kinds of answers. To get that conversation going, that's a big one. Yes, I'd, I'd like to follow that up with um, an, another question that uh, this, com this conversation leads very nicely into. And that's um, whether you are aware of any pedagogical or educational approaches that have brought Goethe's holistic science to uh, young young people, and um, yeah, as 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 a counterbalance to the mechanistic science that is now taught now that, that is taught nowadays. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the where the 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 most that I know about, and there are certainly things I don't know about, are in um, Steiner schools, Waldorf schools, because they go back through Steiner to Goethe, right? Goethe Steiner, who, who founded the Waldorf School movement, um, was a student of Goethe's, based his epistemology um, on Goethe, and then of course developed his own form of what he called spiritual science. Um, and, but the, the, Goethe, the phenomenological approach to um, and contextual way of, of, of looking at nature is, um, kind of written into the curriculum of Waldorf schools. Whether it's done is another question, right? But it has been practiced um, for decades, right, since 1920s um, by people within the Waldorf movement as a pedagogical practice. And um, I myself worked as a, as a Waldorf teacher for 20 years, and I was always trying to work in this way with my students in a way that works for ninth graders or for, you know, 12th graders. Of course, I was taught teaching high school. So you, uh, they're your phenomena too, right? As an educator, the students are your phenomena. So you adapt your subject matter and the way you teach to how the students are. So that uh, there, there's, a, and there's a lot of literature. I mean, more of it in the German speaking language than English, but there's quite a bit out there um, where there you can, um, where, where this approach is practiced. And this is what we try to do in our adult education programs at the Nature Institute and other places do that too, where one tries to, with working with teachers, how can one cultivate this kind of approach as an adult and then find ways to metamorphose it in teaching, in teaching, in being with kindergarten children and being with first graders, or how does it need to be then when somebody's 12 years old? And then again, when they're 18 years old. So um, you have that kind of double challenge of working with the developing children in the changing times with in a phenomenological way. Um, it's, and it's a great task and really important. Um, and that was one thing I was going to say that I didn't say in my talk is I think, you know, this is key for education. I mean, this approach really is key for education and could transform so much um, in a good way um, that could really help people become more rooted in the world and rooted in their own thinking. Um, that unfortunately, especially in American public education has really gotten lost. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'd, I'd like to follow that up with a, a final question. Um, and that's, um, could you say something to the role of painting and drawing as an instrument of, of perception? Yeah. So I, that can all be very important um, because those are means to get out 
into the phenomena. I mean, just painting colors, even if you're not painting this plant or that landscape, but just painting colors and living in the world of color will heighten your perception of color phenomena in the world of the sky and the clouds and the plants and animals. Um, and drawing the same, that you're, you're moving, you actually are perceiving more more closely, yeah, okay, how am I actually seeing this rather than how am I thinking it, right? Um, that was one of Ruskin's, right, things in his little book on drawing, right? that, that instead of drawing what we think we see, we should start drawing what actually is appearing to us. And drawing is a really good way to realize, man, I'm up here in my head rather than with the phenomena. So. The all artistic activities, sculpting, living into forms, moving in space, moving your body, all these kinds of things can heighten your embodied experience of the world and make it more vibrant um, and connect you with it more. So I think that's very important, along with then the cultivation of thinking that that moves with the phenomena rather than this abstraction that we all tend to today through our whole culture to abstract, to, to step away, rather entering in and becoming conscious. So yeah, it's important. So thank you, Craig. That's, that's been a really fantastic talk and also a great set of questions. Uh, I've really enjoyed that. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, and so, yeah, so I'll leave that there for today. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of the participants uh, of this talk. And also, it's great to have you uh, to, to kind of uh, inaugurate our Holistic Science Lecture Series. So that's really, I was also happy when you, uh, when you agreed to uh, lead us into this new uh, project. And... Um, yeah, so I just want to just share the screen of the next talk. So the, the uh, lecture series is uh, the first Thursday of every month. So I'll just then show you the screen. It's uh, by, Judith, by Judith Sassoon. Some, some of you uh, would, will know her from the Holistic Science Conference that was, that was last month. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Bear with me one second. Here we go. Um, Judith, would you just like to say, I'm, I'm putting you on a spot here. Would you just like to say a couple of words about your talk next, next month? Yes, so I'm going to be talking about a beaver, the beaver. <laughs> and this is going to be more of the application of the Goethean way of doing things, of, of looking at nature. So we've had the foundations from Craig today and that was wonderful. And so it will be like the next stage, you know, what can you actually do? How can you actually, I suppose, apply it um, in an observation? And um, the beaver will be the subject of that observation. Great. Thanks, Judith. Um, so yeah, last uh, but not least, um, I'd like to um, obviously um, thank uh, the um, Dartington Hall Trust and Ruskin Mill Land Trust for supporting this, uh, this series of talks financially. And also um, we have a donations page. So if, if, you, if you would also like to support this uh, series uh, to keep it going forward, um, that would be great. Um, our intention is to keep it going for as long as people are willing to uh, join us. So we hope you all, all, that many of you can join us next, um, next month uh, for Judith's talk. So yeah, thank you all very much and see you next time. Thank you.